Well, hey, everyone, what is up? Welcome or welcome back. My name is Austin. This is Gospel Simplicity, and I am so glad that you're here today. Today, we have a really exciting interview for you with Dr. Richard Beck, and we're talking about how to live with an enchanted faith in a disenchanted and skeptical world. I think you're really going to enjoy it. I know I did. It was such a fun conversation. He has such a joyful presence, and I think what this we're talking about here is going to be really, really helpful for you because if you're anything like me, sometimes the world doesn't feel that enchanted, that saturated with God's presence, but we know intellectually that that's the kind of world we want to live in, and I think you're going to really enjoy it. But before we get to it, I want to say real quick thank you to my patrons, subscribers, and merch buyers who make this channel possible, especially to my patrons, those who give monthly out of their great generosity to support me and this channel. Thank you all so much so much. It's because of patrons that this channel is able to continue to grow into exciting and new things. If you notice that like there's not a reflection on my glasses now, it's because because of patrons, I could get a nicer light that doesn't have so much glare. Or if you've noticed the new Gospel Simplicity website, if you haven't, you should check it out, gospelsimplicity.com. That's because of them and so much more. So if you want to support this channel, you can do so by going to patreon.com slash gospel simplicity or by going to gospelsimplicity.com and clicking on the donate button. Well, with all that in mind, I do also want to thank one more group, and that is my sponsor, Kindred. Kindred is a ministry that exists to help people reclaim sacred time with God in their daily lives, something we're kind of talking about in this video. And they do this by creating these beautiful Bibles complete with full page photos, and beautiful text layouts that will cause you to slow down, which how many of us could use that, and to read more contemplatively, getting more out of your time in scripture. I think you're really going to enjoy it. And so if you want to check them out, you can go to kindredapostle.com and use the promo code gospel10 for 10% off your order. Well, here's the video. Well, today I am joined by Dr. Richard Beck. Dr. Richard Beck is an award-winning author, speaker, blogger, and professor of psychology at Abilene Christian University. Every Monday, Richard leads a Bible study for 50 inmates at the Maximum Security French Robertson Unit. And Monday to Friday on his popular blog, Experimental Theology, Richard will spend enormous amounts of time writing about the theology of Johnny Cash, the demonology of Scooby-Doo, or his latest Bible class on monsters, which I have to say sounds so interesting. But Dr. Beck, thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, happy to be here. We can talk about monsters and Scooby-Doo whenever you want. So, Oh, well, that, that <laughs> might have to be a follow-up. Uh, it sounds like a good okay. time. But, uh, a little today, plan for that. Uh, we'll be discussing your recent book, Hunting Magic Eels, which congratulations on that. You've written several books, but I'm sure it always feels good to finish a project like that. But I'd love to know just kind of what inspired this book. Yeah, some of it is just the the demographic statistics we're seeing uh, in the Christian world, especially in the West, uh, the rise of the nuns, people who are not claiming any religious affiliation, increasing rates of uh, skepticism, agnosticism, uh, atheism, uh, and and the general just demographic decline of the church uh, in America and in Europe. Uh, But I think another part is a passion I have for people that have been on a kind of post-evangelical or post-fundamentalist journey. And that journey is often described as a deconstruction, kind of breaking down the faith, kind of coming up with better ways of reading scripture, thinking about the atonement. Uh, But I think a lot of us have seen over the last 10, 15 years that that journey of deconstruction, people get to the end of that and then they don't know what to do. They they end up in a skeptical, doubting place and and they don't often know what the next move is. And so there's a lot of writing right now, reflection about what to do at that moment. How do we turn back towards reconstruction? Uh, so, so two audiences, kind of an ex-evangelical fundamentalist audience, but also just the, the general reader who might be on the outside of faith completely. Yeah, I think that's it's such a, a needed book for these times. And I know as someone who's kind of gone through a bit of that own deconstruction in my own life, that, that pivot to reconstruction can be difficult. And I think it's something that is needed. And I'm grateful for the role that your book can play for people going through that. Uh, Just for those that aren't familiar, so I just quickly introduced your book as Hunting Magic Eels, and then we began talking about deconstruction and nuns. How how does that title link together? I'm sure if people pick up the book, they'll get it, but if I just told them that title, I'm not sure this would be the topic they'd expect. That's right, yeah. The publisher grabbed the title because the opening line of the book was, 
uh, we were hunting for magic eels and my wife and I and a friend Hannah were in Wales visiting a Celtic uh, ruin where St. Dwindwin, a Celtic saint, uh, had a monastery and she had this well. And in the well, the rumor was that there were these magical eels that if a lover threw in a token of their beloved into the well and an eel disturbed it, that, that was an omen, a sign that their lover would be faithful you know, for life. So obviously this well became a site of massive pilgrimage and St. Dwindwin now is the St. Valentine's for uh, wells. And so I was, I kind of tell that whimsical story at the front end of the book to just illustrate that's not our world. Uh, we don't seek out magical eels for premarital counseling anymore. And, and so I use that to describe this journey that sociologists call enchantment, a world full of wonder and supernatural belief um, in occult, the magical, and how we've journeyed into what we're calling a disenchanted age, an age of increasing doubt, skepticism, science is now the arbiter of what is true or not, and faith is kind of increasingly being left as an ancient, uh, out of use superstition. So, the the enchantment in the title subtitle is about trying to recover that sacred wonder at the heart of faith for disenchanted, skeptical audiences. Yeah, I really love that angle of enchantment and disenchantment. It was something that really piqued my interest about this book because it wasn't just another book about doubt per se, but it had mm-hmm. this angle of kind of the way we think about the world and what we're what we're missing in that perhaps. And for those that might be a bit skeptical as our age is, and they hear a story as, you know, the setup to the book is about, you know, hunting these magic eels, if you will. And they think, well, isn't it good that we've moved past that? Like, hasn't science really helped us, et cetera? What, what have we lost maybe in this disenchantment? And why is disenchantment a problem for us? Yeah, so I, I, I think the, the answer there is that in many ways, science is a great good. Um, and, but, but clearly, when we look at the statistic of mental health in our modern era, that we're seeing increasing rates of depression uh, and anxiety, uh, suicide rates are going up, addiction, epidemics of loneliness. So it's true that we've made some material and technological advancements, but becoming untethered from a ground of kind of sacred meaning uh, from God, that we're ailing in, in, in various ways, that, are, that our mental health or equilibrium seems a little unsteady now. And so to me, that's been one of the losses. And this isn't just me making this as a person of faith, uh, especially during the pandemic, you've seen lots of secular uh, writers talking about the crisis of meaning of the modern world and how uh, without recovering that, psychologists know that meaning is one of the most reliable of variables in predicting kind of mental resiliency and mental health. And, but that's harder for us in a disenchanted age, which we could talk about. But to me, that's, that's the thing we're missing there. It's not necessarily that, that we want to deny science and go back to a superstitious past. I mean, I think people should get their vaccines and antibiotics are good. And I love air conditioning here in West Texas. So we're not turning our back on that technology. But when I'm looking around for something that gives my life kind of a depth and weight and a ground, um, especially in the face of my failure, um, then that's where a conversation about God can show up. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I think it's, you bring so much value to the table as both a person of faith and a person with this background in psychology and being able to make those worlds speak to each other in a meaningful way, which is something I really enjoyed. Along these similar lines, you have this phrase in your book called the ache that people are experiencing in this disenchanted world and our increasingly non-religious world. What is this ache and what are we aching for, perhaps even if we don't have the language to identify what it is? Yeah, so uh, a lot of this book was forged in my classroom trying to talk about faith to uh, young people, college age uh, people. And, And again, their demographic is the one increasingly walking away from faith. And they, they have tended to see Christianity in predominantly moral terms. And when I, I grew up conservative, uh, conservative Christian, and I always framed the gospel in moral terms, that, that the issue in front of me was uh, being a good person or being saved. And my students, that's kind of their default. But I've shifted the conversation into their restlessness, the things I've just mentioned. They, they are um, also the most anxious generation uh, on record as as a cohort. 
And so I try to get to the root of that anxiety and I call that the ache, that, that, that restlessness. And one place you can talk about it is meaning. Um, and the reason why meaning is increasingly fragile and disenchanted age is because without a transcendent purpose that gives my life meaning, uh, and that doesn't necessarily have to be Christian, but, but obviously traditional religion is a, is a part of that. But if without that, then I have to kind of construct meaning on my own. I have to tell a story about why my life matters. And, but, but because we're telling that story to ourselves, we know that that story is, you know, a fiction I'm telling myself. I, 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 it's also fragile and that the story that I tell myself is prone to breaking. Um, my dreams might not be realized. I might face a setback. And so my students feel that they, they have a dream. I'm going to go to college. I'm going to get in this graduate school. I'm going to make a career. But they also feel that that is very precarious, that if I get a B in this class, then this entire future story that gave my life a direction, kind of a north uh, pole for my life, that is all now on the line right now in this class. And so their anxiety uh, shoots through the roof. And so to me, faith is always given and conferred a degree of shame, resiliency in the face of those problems, that, that when my life doesn't come out the way I want it to, a religious person has always had that ability to kind of say, okay, my story uh, that I told myself that made me significant and, and worthy of, of your attention or belonging to a group, when that fails or falters, and all the metrics of the American meritocracy point to my shame or my failure, that I at least have this move in my mind that at least God grounds my value. Um, and religious people always have kind of had that option. And it, it gives a degree of resiliency in the face of hardship. And that's kind of just a fact. Um, study after study after study have shown that people of faith tend to be more uh, happier. They, they tend to be more psychologically resilient. I think it's because they have that safety net of dignity and value and meaning in the face of, of hardship. Yeah, there's so much fascinating thing, so many fascinating things there as far as the interplay of anxiety and meaning and then how when we're grounding meaning in ourself or our own kind of self-propagated uh, story that our sense of value is so, um, so brittle there that it can be very uh -huh. easily shaken. And then we, we see, I mean, I think anyone that I talk to in my generation will be very, uh, very familiar with anxiety, whether they're struggling mm -hmm. with it or people around them are struggling with it. And in proportions that are disproportionate to what we've seen perhaps before. And I think it's fascinating the, the connections that you're making there. I, I want to pivot. A, or go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I think there's another reason why we see kind of social justice activism on the rise amongst mm -hmm. young people. So in a, in a post-Christian era, I am looking to connect my story to come some arena of heroic moral action so that so that my life is contributing to something that is kind of transcendent. In this case, right, the search for justice. There's a religious longing at the heart of that. And I think that's why my students, as they opt out of church and start opting for social justice, there, there's still a thirst for God that's spinning through there. But the point is that the ache even haunts social justice activism, that the social justice activists struggle with anxiety and anger and burnout. And, and if you've spent any time in activist communities, it, it tends to be a young person's game in many ways because the emotional burnout, the emotional, toy, and the, the, the hot burn of anger that drives it a lot of people feel it's just not psychologically healthy, physically healthy for, for a lifespan. And so, so that's even where the A could come along that social justice warrior and say, hey, you do need space for grace. Uh, you, need, you do need space for mercy and joy. Um, otherwise, the revolution will burn you out. And, and so anyway, I just want to kind of point to how the ache even shows up in that thirst for social justice and that quest for meaning. That's fascinating. I'm really glad you brought that up because I think it's something that's so prevalent and it's an interesting indicator of this search for transcendence and something that seems very much this worldly to kind of use that uh, mm -hmm. two story language, which you get at in your book as kind of problematic, which we can talk about in mm -hmm. a second. Um, but it reminds me of, I don't know if you're familiar with the work of Mark Sayers. He's uh, done some great books, Disappearing Church, Reappearing Church, kind of cultural commentary. But he talks about that today, you know, in the post-Christian context, we want 
the the kingdom, the fruits of the kingdom without the king. So we we want that transcendence and that vision of mm-hmm. what you know the gospel is presented as the kingdom of God, but we just don't really want the king, if you will, and that um, we we can kind of see the very Christian language and kind of ethos, but stripping its foundation, which ultimately will lead to burnout, like you pointed to. Yeah, I think that's right. Mm. So something I wanted to talk about as well, because I think it's a really important part of your book that I think is very relevant to kind of how faith is um, being conceptualized today, but also what what people in a post-Christian context are going to be looking for. And you talk about the relationship between faith and experience. I, I don't want to kind of steal your thunder too much. So could you just flesh out a bit the relationship between faith and experience? Yeah, I think a lot of people, like you said, are writing a lot about this crisis of doubt in the culture, but also in our pews. Um, and typically we have this conversation in, uh, on, the, on the level of belief, and that, so Christianity and doubt is a matter of belief. My book is taking a different angle and suggesting that it's primarily a crisis of attention, which then affects experience. And, and I found that a more fruitful sandbox to, to play in because when you, when you talk about belief and doubt and you're talking to somebody who's struggling to believe, and I've talked to lots of people that have struggled to believe, th- that they feel like it's just an unbridgeable gap. Uh, I'm over here on my side with my doubts, and on the far side is this this full hearted belief in the existence of God and and uh, Jesus has risen from the dead, and, and I just can't jump that abyss. I, I can't will myself to believe, and I, I think that's why people get stuck in deconstruction and they can't make the turn because it seems like the only option we're giving them is just will power, and and will power doesn't lead to belief. So my idea is if we can cultivate more of an experiential entry point where I begin encountering the transcendent and the sacred in my life, then then that those experiences provide a scaffolding. They they begin bridging the the gap between disbelief and doubt into into belief. And and I argue in the book, it's a form of what's called attention blindness that we have. I'm borrowing this from an experiment done by Daniel Simons, and it was used by Andrew Root in a book of his about that internet meme where there's like a two basketball teams passing a basketball back and forth, and you're told to count the number of passes between the teams, and you do it, and then it says, okay, you counted the passes correctly, but did you see the dancing gorilla? And 50% of subjects who've gone through this experiment don't see it. I, I didn't see it the first time I saw it. But a video replays and yeah, there comes a dancing grill in the middle of the passing teams. And and what's fascinating about that is here is this most obvious thing, like from just a pure perceptual uh, frame, that's the most obvious thing that happened. There's a person in a gorilla suit doing a dance. And yet the obvious thing is not seen because of what Daniel Simon has called attention blindness. My attention Uh, helps me see some things, but it also blinds me to very obvious aspects of reality. And so I I use that idea and kind of say, that's what's happening in a skeptical disenchanted age. God is still there. And this might be heretical to say, God's there as the dancing gorilla, the obvious thing, but we can't see it because the way the modern world has redirected and shaped our attention. So uh, God has gone missing. And, And so that's not an issue of belief. Believing in the dancing gorilla, we're just drawing attention back to the sacred reality that's that's right there in front of you. If you can retrain yourself to see this this obvious thing, yeah, there's a whole lot there. I think it's such a such an apt illustration of what's going on because it illustrates this idea that God's always been there. It's not like in the Enlightenment God went away, but our attention shifted and our focus shifted, mm-hmm. and we we became blind to what was right before us. The other thing I really like about this connection between faith and experience is this idea that I think increasingly today, and I think this is connected perhaps to a a shorter attention span or what we're looking at, but people aren't necessarily interested just in, is this idea abstractly true apart from my personal experience, but like, does this work? And that's almost the entry point to, should I care if this is true? And I think in the past, perhaps we've looked at evangelism and Uh, apologetics in terms of can we convince people of this set of ideas but i think today that 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 thrived on the assumption that they might actually care but if people don't care we have to first say does this 
does this work? Does this do anything for you? Are you going to experience mm -hmm. this? And I thought that was a valuable point in linking those two ideas. I do want to ask, though, because I know that for some people, maybe they grew up on the former paradigm, or maybe they've been in uh, traditions that maybe overemphasized experience in certain unhealthy ways, and they mm -hmm. might be kind of a bit allergic to talk about experience when we talk about faith. And because I think for some people, they have this preconceived notion that when we start talking about experience, doctrine goes out the window, that if we focus on the experience, well, then it doesn't really matter what we believe or we'll end up believing just whatever we feel mm -hmm. that day. What would you say to put those people at ease in this conversation about faith and experience? Hey, we'll be right back to the interview, but first I want to tell you about another sponsor for today, and that is Faithful Counseling. Faithful Counseling is a group of Christian counselors that exist to help you get the help you need. You know, one of the first YouTube videos I ever made was called You Can Have Jesus and a Therapist Too. And what I wanted to do in that video was draw out the fact that so many people are struggling with mental health. And the last thing we want to do is make it more difficult for people to reach out to get the help they need by creating this stigma around it. It's something that I'm really passionate about and think we need to end in Christian circles. And that's why I'm so excited to be partnering with Faithful Counseling. Their counselors all will be counseling from a Christian perspective, and you can connect with them from any country in the world. They have counselors that speak many different languages. And hey, if you, it's important to you to have a counselor from your specific tradition or background, they can do their part to try to pair you up with one of them as well. All of their counselors are licensed with over 3,000 hours of experience. You can connect with these counselors in a variety of ways. For, in fact, you can do video sessions, phone calls, live chat, or messaging. All of the messaging is secure. And if it's between scheduled ses sessions, you'll receive a response within 24 to 48 hours. If this is interesting to you, if you think this would be helpful for you or maybe a loved one, I'd encourage you to go to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. If you do that, first of all, you'll get 10% off your order and you'll be matched with a counselor in less than 24 hours hours. Again, that's faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity to be matched with a counselor in less than 24 hours and get 10% off your first month. Faithful counseling costs $260 per month, which gets you unlimited messaging with your counselor and four 30 minute sessions. But again, if you go to faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity, you'll get 10% off that first month. Lastly, faithful counseling is not a crisis line. If you are currently experiencing suicidal thoughts or ideation, please reach out to a crisis line or hotline. You can find one of them at www.crisistextline.org. Please do so and reach out. You do not have to do this alone. Well, thank you all so much, and I will let you get back to the video. But if you want to check them out, again, faithfulcounseling.com slash gospel simplicity. The link is in my bio and in the pinned comment. Well, back to the interview. Yeah, so one of the parts of my book that I'm most proud of and, and I don't know if I should say that out loud, but when I, in many ways, the book is perfectly suited to a spiritual, not religious age, because I'm, I'm making this big appeal to perhaps a less institutionally religious Christianity, but say maybe attend to more the, the ways uh, we experience spirituality in experiential register. And so there's a lot of books like that out there as well. But to your point, it also opens up the window of the degree to which I, my experience can become uh, very internal, private, and then my experience can be used to trump any other sort of uh, truth that might come to me. So I spend the last part of the book talking about the, 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 that old biblical idea of discerning the spirits. That yes, I, I do think we need to open ourselves up to uh, an increasing bandwidth, you might say, of the spectrum of the way God can speak to us. It's not just going to come intellectually through a doctrinal conversation, but there's emotional and aesthetic and other sorts of ways God comes to me. Um, but then we also kind of need to put those experiences in some sort of discernment process to where I am not just being, and there's, there's a couple different problems here. One is your, your, your concern about doctrine, that it can take me off into um, uh, some bad doctrinal places. But the other concern that I try to deal with in the book is that that spiritual but not religious fr frame could be really um, kind of self-indulgent. And, and then I'm just, I'm just, God just becomes this thing that kind of baptizes uh, my lifestyle, uh, my prejudices. And so there's, there's that aspect as well. The not just the doctrinal issue, but kind of the idolatry that can happen when we elevate our experience at the expense of other considerations. 
Yeah, that, I thought that was a really valuable part of the book as well. And it's it's always neat to hear what excites people most about what they've written. I'm sure the whole project <laughs> is exciting, but there's you know something that might have really spoken to you as an author, which is always great to get to hear on my end. As we talk about this idea of faith and experience, there's one more thing I want to pull up that you bring out in your book, which I thought was really insightful, and I think people will benefit from that. You have this quote where you say, too many Christians are living like atheists, operating as if God doesn't exist. We might believe in God, but we don't expect to encounter God. I I think a lot of people are going to resonate with this, but for those who maybe aren't too sure about it, they're like, well, I believe in God. How could I live like an atheist? Aren't those mutually opposed? What are some indicators in someone's life that though they might be able to check off all the questions of do you believe in X, Y, or Z, they're actually living like an atheist? Yeah, it goes back to that issue of belief versus experience again. So one might be able to check a belief box, like mentally, I believe that there, you know, God is there. But experientially, I would say the diagnostic piece is, is that I, I would say a posture of expectation. Do you move through the day with a posture that you will be encountering God from the moment you wake up to the moment you you close your eyes? And I would say that posture of expectation, a, a capacity for surprise, uh, uh, is to me the, the idea of not living like an atheist, that God is a close companion th- you know, with me throughout the day. And, and, and so I, one of the chapters of the book, I talk about kind of the charismatic uh, enchantments and, and the, the charismatic, but also the contemplatives, both the charismatics and the contemplatives just have a lived sense that God is always present in their life. They have very different ways of explaining it and, and getting to that moment, but they are living with a posture of openness that God is in this moment. So to me, that's the way I would ask the question. How do you know if you're living like a functional atheist? Do you wake up with that expectation that God is already speaking and coming to you uh, in the minutia and in the mundane parts of your day? Or is it kind of like, yeah, I believe in God, um, but it's, it's only when I show up at church do I kind of really think about it. Only when all my social cues are telling me this is the time you're supposed to have a religious focus. And then the rest of my day, from mowing the lawn to coaching the soccer game to doing the Excel spreadsheet at work and zeroing out my email box, um, that I'm not really thinking about God in any of those moments. Yeah, I love that. And something I love, if people are listening closely to that, what people might expect when we say a Christian who believes the doctrines but lives like an atheist If they're working on the paradigm that we discussed at the beginning, where Christianity is primarily a moral matter that many of your students might come in with, what they're probably going to expect from that is, well, a Christian who's living like an atheist is someone who's living a really immoral life. Now, Uh that could be, there's a category of Christians that are living immoral lives, certainly. But I think what's important here is what you're highlighting is that with this paradigm of faith and experience, to live like an atheist is to not expect to encounter Uh God, which I think might be a paradigm shift for people, but I think will be helpful. Yeah, I hope so. Like, do do you wake up looking for the dancing gorilla? That's how I describe it to people. I'm like, what is that sacred, holy thing that you will encounter today that you're going to miss because of your hurry, your distraction, or your functional atheism? Like, what is the sacred thing that is going to be right in front of your nose and you're not going to see it? That that's to me getting at this issue that you're talking about. It that's not a matter of belief. That's a matter of where my attention is trained. It's a perceptual issue. Are you seeing um, rather than are you believing in this thing? Yeah, I'm excited to get into it. Maybe a little bit of the practical side a little later on as we can talk about. Well, how would someone go about doing that? But what I want to hit on now is something you actually just brought up, and that's the you talked about in your book four different enchanted Christianities. And you lay out liturgical, contemplative, charismatic, and Celtic. And I thought they were all really Mm -hmm. interesting. But I'd love to hone in on the liturgical and charismatic, because I think for a lot of people, people would think (laughs) those two are like, those two don't go together. And I know there's movements out there that do that, but it's not even necessarily that you're arguing for, you know, raising your hands during a really uh, traditional liturgy. But Mm -hmm. how, how do both of these promote a more enchanted faith when most people might think of them very differently. Yeah. So the first part of the book, I'm giving my own kind of recommendations about what it might look like um, to 
redirect your attention toward the sacred. But then I pause and say, but we're not really starting from scratch here. Christianity is full of what I call enchanted traditions. And so the liturgical, contemplative, charismatic, and Celtic are just four. And I, and I want that to be a big tent. They all are coming at enchantment. They all, they all have different practices to recommend themselves. But the liturgical, I think its strength is that it, it gives us liturgies and structures where we can um, build our day around enchanted rhythms. That's its strength. And so celebrating the liturgical calendar. So my, my time becomes re-enchanted. Um, daily prayer um, or, litur or, or daily liturgies where uh, upon waking up, I, I say a prayer of gratitude. So, so the liturgical enchantments, I think, are really powerful in that they create uh, habits that can become be somewhat automatic disciplines. So the whole spiritual discipline conversation comes from that. The charismatics um, really are not going to do a lot of that discipline stuff, but they are going to emphasize things like affectivity and, and emotionality. So for me, that was a big moment in my life. My, a lot of us, our, our journey of deconstruction is very intellectual. It, 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 it's like the atonement is this Rubik's cube and I got to solve it. That the problem of evil is this Rubik's cube, and I got to solve it. Uh, how to read Genesis with uh, you know evolution is a Rubik's cube, and I have to solve it. And we spend all our time reading and thinking and deconstructing and solving the Rubik's cube. And and as you know, if you've been on that journey, you don't ever solve it. There's better or worse answers, but no final moment where like boom, it all is answered. But without but but what what you've done is you you've treated your spiritual journey as getting an answer to an intellectual question and you've divorced the faith from the the emotional register and i think that's where the charismatics are really strong and they're saying you know god speaks to the heart and that's obviously you'll see a lot in charismatic praise but that kind of emphasis on the heart but this isn't just the charismatic this goes back to blaise pascal uh, in the catholic tradition who said the heart has its reasons that reason knows nothing about and so to me uh Focusing on the emotional aspects of faith, the way your heart is telling you truths about who you are um, and where God is found and located um, is, is a compass, right? Our hearts are a compass. And this is like uh, Paul in Acts 14. Paul is preaching this sermon in Acts 14 to these pagans, and he can't refer to the Jewish history at all. They don't know anything about Moses. They don't know anything about King David. And so he, he draws their attention to nature right? The God that creates the harvest and the rain. And then the last thing he says is, and he fills your heart with joy. And so Paul draws their attention to this God that they have not heard of and says, hey, your joy is pointing to the dancing gorilla. That's where I want your eyes to go. And you're like, oh, that's God, right? That's God, joy. So to me, the charismatics get at that um, really well. Yeah, I think there is a real strength there and a real kind of breaking down of some of those maybe intellectual walls, not making the intellect not matter, but showing that we come to faith with our whole self, not just as James K. Smith uh, refers to us as, as brains on a stick, that there's, mm -hmm. there's more to us than that. And I realized that, you know, these two jumped out to me as particularly interesting, but other people reading might have you know, had different things jump out. And I'm sure after listing all four, my audience might go, well, why didn't you ask about the other two? So if it's okay, I'd love uh, to kind of, you know, just ask, what is it that you see in the Celtic tradition and in the contemplative tradition that particularly gives uh, root to an enchanted faith? Yeah. The, the Celtic one, um, and there's many things I talk about in the Celtic uh, tradition, but the one that jumps out um, as really different from the other four is the way nature um, is a location of, of God's kind of sacramental presence in our lives. So a sacrament being that visible sign of an invisible reality. And we typically in the, you know, religious world identify the sacraments with like baptism and the Eucharist. But the Celtics said, hey, rain is a sacrament. God comes to us in the rain. God comes to us in the wind and in the rivers and in the mountains and in the sunset. And so that, that's what's called a sacramental ontology where nature itself becomes a material witness to a divine reality. So I think the Celt, and I think a lot of people, skeptics, um, like outsiders to faith, uh, nature is often the place where they're experiencing transcendence uh, easiest. And so we can point to that and say, hey, that's God coming to you in those 
uh, beautiful spaces and places. Uh, the contemplative one, mainly, mainly I talk about uh, prayer practices. Um, and so like, it's, it's close to the liturgical and the contemplative. So the liturgical one was more about the structures of liturgy of a life. But contemplative, I dig into specific prayer practices like Brother Lawrence's practicing the presence of God, how we're always kind of bringing God to mind, even in the midst of, of work. And I, that's the richness of that uh, contemplative strain, that practicing the presence of God. Yeah, those are really interesting. And I think the idea of a sacramental ontology and realizing that we live in an enchanted world, not just that our churches are enchanted mm -hmm. or our prayer life is enchanted, but, but nature itself speaks to us about who God is. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a lot to be learned there. You've cited several people as you've gone through Brother Lawrence, Blaise Pascal, others along the way. I'd be curious, what was like the research process like for this? I'm sure there's people that hear this and you're pulling from many different wells. Is this kind of background knowledge for you or was there a specific uh, way that you were looking into these? Because I imagine there might be people that are saying, oh, I'd like to kind of learn about some of these things, but uh -huh. I don't know where to start. Yeah, some some of it's been research, but some of it's just been life experience. Because um, when I got from an autobiographical note, when I got to kind of the end of my rope uh, in the season of deconstruction, I really felt like I was just barely holding on to faith. I, I began a kind of a panicked, <laughs> kind of a panicked exploration for anything helpful. And, and I found help in like things like prayer beads. Um, just something in my from so like the rosary or the orthodox prayer ropes but there, I just found help in something material to hold on to and remind me um, of God and icons and things like that but I also found prayer practices like structured prayer morning prayer and evening prayer even when I'm not feeling it that idea that you go to the gym you know, and that's the point. That's the discipline. You go to the gym even when you don't feel like it. Prayer is like that. Prayer is going to the gym. You just do it regularly. And so I, that was helpful to me to have structured prayer when I didn't have my own words. Um, the, the, the one I had to research the most, though, um, fresh for the book, was the Celtic. I knew there were resources there, but I, I wouldn't have said that I was an expert on Celtic Christianity. And, and that was, to me, the funnest chapter to write because... Celtic Christianity is a bit of a brand right now. Uh, there's a lots of books and retreat speakers and kind of spiritual gurus that kind of talk about Celtic Christianity. And so I wanted to kind of s sort out the kind of the woo woo stuff and, and the stuff that was like real historical Celtic Christianity. And so I, yeah, that one was a research project, lots of books on Celtic Christianity, historical sources. And, 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 and that was a fun chapter to write, uh, but the charismatic one, was my was just a, a providential accident. I, I found myself worshiping in a, a little charismatic mission church, and and their robust praise and experience of God, um, in many ways, helped save my faith. And so some of it, so some of it's just a search. Some of it was research, and some of it was just you know an accident of finding myself a holy accident, we'll say, and finding myself in a given tradition and being blessed by it. That's really neat. And I love how you talked about it as a providential or holy accident, because I think even the way we talk about things sometimes reminds us of what kind of world we live in, right? Is, mm -hmm. Did I stumble into that church or, or was there some type of greater meaning behind this and maybe a more enchanted faith? We might say, this wasn't an accident. This was a, a providential action. Yeah. And I have a professor who is very big on us speaking in the way that we, we say we believe, and he's always getting on us about things like that. And I think that it, it is interesting how those things connect. And not to belabor a point, but I also thought it was really neat what you said that when you were at the end of your rope, you were asking, you were looking just for something helpful. And it kind of gets back to that idea of faith and experience, right? Because you got to your end end of the rope, and I'm sure there was lots of intellectual journey along that and, you know, past that as well. But what you weren't asking at that point, at least the way you phrased it was, like, give me something that I can, give me some truth that I can adhere to, but help me find something that, that works in my life to actually connect with you, God. And I, I mm -hmm. think that's telling about what it is that we're ultimately searching for. Yeah, I think... 
you know, we've already mentioned a lot of, you know, practical things we've talked about, like, like structured prayer, right? So if you can't pray, use the Book of Common Prayer or the Divine Office um, or Phyllis Tickle's, you know, the, the Divine Hours um, uh, uh, or, or, or just praying the Jesus Prayer using an Orthodox prayer rope where you're praying that over and over again. Nature. Um, I talk about poetry um, from the Celtic tradition. Poetry is a way to re-enchant your experience. So for me, like somebody like a Mary Oliver is just so helpful for me to kind of re-enchant nature. Um, but but other practices that are very ancient, but very, so helpful is like uh, the Ignatian practice of examine. So like we were talking about being a kind of a Christian atheist where I am not thinking about God during the day at all. And, and, and admittedly, we're busy. OK, and we're dealing with a lot of things. And so it's hard to kind of just constantly. So this this bumping into God doesn't have to be really woo woo here because the practice of exam is just at the end of the day, just do desolations and consolations. Where during the day were you anxious? When were you stressed? When did you feel uh, alone uh, or in the desert? And vers conversely, going back to joy, when did you feel grace? When did God come to you? When did you feel compassion or joy or wonder or awe? And that just inventory at the end of the day from the Jesuit tradition is, I think, a beautiful way of practicing attention. Instead of just going to sleep, just taking a moment to kind of trace the ribbon of God through your day uh, is a just really practical thing you can do. Um, you know, start a, if that's too religious, start a gratitude journal. Um, just begin saying thanks. That places you in a prayerful posture because to say thanks is to receive a gift. And even if you have doubts about who's the giver, gratitude is a prayer posture. And, and, and we also know it has just so many mental health benefits. So if you don't believe in it, it's good for you to do. Um, and, and so all of those just kind of just, examples of ways we can use all of these traditions to kind of be very practical in focusing back to um, like the dancing gorilla in our lives. And also I say, go to church, you know, I mean, again, if, if, if like, if it's going like, I get it. Like you go to church and like nothing happens for me, but, but again, it's the process of making yourself continually available so that you can be interrupted by God. Because we know you're not going to be interrupted if you just sleep in or watch more Netflix. Like it's not going to happen. But you got to keep putting yourself out there in a posture, in a disciplined way, where you can be surprised by God. Yeah, I love that you bring that up as well because I think you mentioned earlier that you know we have a lot of people who would identify maybe as spiritual but not religious, and for them, church might be a difficult hurdle. And I don't want to downplay the fact that many people have been hurt by the church, and it uh -huh. feels difficult to get back into the church or get into the church for the first time. That might just feel foreign. But I think there is something so valuable to that, not to mention that it's something we're, we're called to do by, by God if you, if you are a follower of Jesus. But I think having that rhythm of life. Like you said, you're not going to get interrupted if you're just sleeping in or you're mm -hmm. just watching Netflix. But there's something about gathering together as the community as well, because this isn't just an individual journey. And maybe I'd be curious if you have any thoughts on that, of the nature of this as, you know, there is our relationship between us and God, but it's not mm -hmm. just, you know, two parties there. What, what role does the community play in this or the people we surround ourselves with? Oh, I mean, that's huge. And I would say that'd probably be a bit of a weakness of the book where I didn't lean into how communities uh, aid us in carrying us during seasons of doubt or deconstruction um, and, and how God yeah, just doesn't come to us in the wind and the rain, but through other human beings. Um, yeah, so there's just some things that are going to happen in communities. So for, uh, like an obvious thing is that Christians are a singing people. Like, like, at the, like one of the worship practices that we're we, we, you know, borrowing from the Jewish tradition on is to is singing. And there is just something about music and singing together that uh, communicates truths and, uh, and it affects us emotionally and physically that if we are by ourselves, um, uh, we might listen to music, but the, the kind of full hearted singing with a group of people, there's 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 not a lot that can replace that. But also, uh, I, I'm interrupted by the sacred experiences of other people. So like my charismatic friends, 
when I first went there, I was like a very skeptical person. So in, in the book, uh, an interesting thing is when I talk about how skeptics bump into miracle stories. And so here I was, this kind of skeptical Christian sitting in a charismatic church. And a large part of charismatic testimonials are like miracle stories, like uh, money showing up at the last minute to pay a bill. Or even this, the, this, the things we make fun of where people, I'm thankful that I, that the, I prayed that the traffic light turned from red to green. And we, and we can make fun of some of that stuff and we can kind of be skeptical about it. But, but sitting in a more open-hearted posture, listening to those stories, the one thing that I noticed about my charismatic friends is just um, how they were, like you were saying, very quick to give thanks to God for these good, for these gifts that they just saw themselves as a part of a story where God was always showing up and always giving good gifts and just giving thanks. And so when I saw miracle stories is less a, a supernatural tale that I had to decide was true or false, but rather just a posture of continual gratitude for the graces of the day that, that again, that helped me um, that their, their, way of seeing God help chasten some of my immediate skepticism. And there's just ways that when we are really open hearted towards each other, that we can minister each other in that way. And then by myself, I'm locked in my head. And it's that kind of introverted, intellectualized journey that I think can become so toxic, especially during a season in a pandemic when we've been driven into ourselves even more. At some point, others open us back up to like, you know, that's not my experience, but I hear that in you and I love you. So I'm going to check my skepticism here and just kind of come into this with an open heart. Uh, there's something, again, that posture of surprise, I think is cultivated when we, when we listen to each other's experiences and honor them. Yeah. That's a really great point. How the experiences of others can almost by proxy be an experience for us of that interruption mm -hmm. of uh, the divine in our life. And I think that's a really, really great point. I hope that people kind of walk away from this, maybe with a renewed sense of the importance of those communal experiences, especially after mm -hmm. such a long year of so much solitude. Yeah. And I've, when I've done um, uh, sessions about this with churches to talk about reenchantment. Some of the one, some of the churches that have, that, that have put, tried to put some of this in the practice, some of the most powerful things that they've done is when they have gathered their people um, to tell stories. So storytelling as a practice of reenchantment. So gather people around a meal and just say, tell me where God has shown up in your life. Maybe it was recently, or maybe it was back when you were a teenager, but like, tell me a moment where God showed up. And we, and, and if you do that with a group of people, like you, the dancing gorilla will come into view. Like you, you, after that season of storytelling, you will be stunned. Um, and you go like, wow. Okay. Even if you're skeptical, you're like, something's going on here. So I, I would say storytelling um, as a communal practice is a way to recover enchantment. That's really interesting. I think we see that in scripture too, right? As the, mm -hmm. the people of Israel are being shaped, it's by the, not only the telling of stories that are happening at their time, but then the retelling and kind of almost this spiritual discipline of remembering what God has done in the past, which I think mm -hmm. would uh, translate itself very easily to a, you know, a church community where you're talking about mm -hmm. what God's doing in your life. And then you're not just forgetting about that by next week, but you're remembering, oh yeah, like God, God showed up in this way in my life. And let me lean on that in these times that might feel Mm -hmm. a bit darker. I'd be curious, you know, along those similar lines, are there other practices that you've heard from people that, you know, they've, they've read this book and they've taken away and they've implemented this or things that you recommend to them that have been particularly helpful for them as kind of like a, a practical takeaway for people? Uh, the story, the storytelling is the one that has been most noteworthy that that is that I didn't mention. Because if you if you read the book, like I throw a, a wide net. <laughs> you know, out there uh, that, yeah, that's been the main one um, that I've seen people use is, is the storytelling. Um, yeah. That's, that's really great. I, that's, <laughs> it's always neat to hear kind of you take, you know, you give people lots of ideas and then it kind of grows and you learn things from that. And if there's ever a second edition of the book, maybe that will get put in there. <laughs> but uh -huh. um, that's, that's wonderful. I have greatly enjoyed this, Dr. Beck. Thank you so much for your time today. There's, there's one other thing that I want to get at that I think as, as we come towards the end of this, and I, I don't want to necessarily end on this because it might 
feel like a bit of a skeptical note, but you talk a bit in your book about discerning of spirits, and this is a you know a, an ancient Christian practice. And if mm-hmm. if people walk away from this and they say, "I want to make a greater effort to pay attention to God and what God is doing and experience Him more in my life, have a more enchanted faith," how do they begin to distinguish the experiences they're having? If that is that something of God, or is that I don't know the way my food sat after eating, like. How how can people begin to do that in a way that is not overly skeptical, but maybe also just healthy for them? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I would say, and I make this point at the end of the book. Um, I don't say it this way because the book was written for a th- uh, general audience, but the, the nerdy theological way to say that is to kind of always adopt a Christological uh, filter for our experiences. Um so, so the leading edge of enchantment is going to be the experiences we've been talking about, joy and gratitude and wonder. Um, and uh, uh, But also the thing I would say is that it's not just uplift because that's where I think people think that, that what I'm talking about is this is just about, you know, uplift. But to me, ask yourself, is, is this enchantment, um, is it pushing me into a, uh, a – a, a, a relationship that might be hard for me is it causing me to cross social boundaries. And basically, am I learning to love a little bit better because of this enchantment? And the other thing is, is can the enchantment um, criticize you? That might sound weird, but, but the other issue here is we just, we're just not trying to add some like mystical tinsel on top of our like middle-class American lives um, to give it a little, you know, zest, a little pepper the, the we want, if this is God we're talking about, there will be moments where this enchant will show up and ask us to do a hard thing. And so you see that like Peter in Acts 10, where the enchantment of the vision of the unclean animals causes him to cross a social boundary. Ask yourself that. Has, has my enchantment asked me to do that, to kind of cross over to the other side of the railroad tracks and experience God uh, with those people that I'd previously treated with some degree of suspicion. So those are the kinds of things I would ask from, from a discerning perspective it, to keep it from just being a little woo woo or a little, just the kind of middle class, you know, playing around with some dabbling in some enchantments um, to something that is really cruciform or cross shaped. Uh, so I would always put Jesus out there as kind of the model. If you want to know if the voice you're hearing is from God, is it causing you to do that transgressive hard thing where you're giving yourself away for others, even people that it might be really hard to love. I love that. It reminds me of St. Augustine's famous rule for interpretation of scripture is, is this leading you to love God more and love others more? And I think the way you talk about it being cruciform and especially the idea of, can this criticize you? Because I think that's going to be a humbling question for a lot of people in their faith journey of, Am I really just giving greater weight to the opinions I already have by saying that mm-hmm. God agrees with me on this? Or does does God have the ability to change my mind? It, if it's me versus God in this, who's going to win? And I think that can be a humbling question and a good one to sit with. I, I don't want to end on that, though. I do want to give just one more question for people who... Because I think a lot of people are going to walk away from this and resonate with this idea of, man, I, I am living in a disenchanted world, and I don't want to be living in a disenchanted world. I feel that ache, and I, I want mm-hmm. to, to regain that sense of joy and awe and wonder at the world, but I'm not sure how I'm going to do it, but you've given lots of great tips, and I will say, if people have enjoyed this, there's so much more in the book that they should definitely go look mm-hmm. at, and um, I think you'll benefit from it greatly. But for those people that are embarking on this, who walk away from this and say, this is something I'm going to begin to put into my life, what encouragement would you give them, specifically maybe for the highs and lows of this journey? Because I can imagine people might say, go on a a spiritual retreat and feel great. Mm -hmm. And it feels like the world is sacred. And then the next day they're back at their office, you know, where it's not a beautiful view or something. And the world doesn't feel as sacred or they're doing dishes and the world isn't feeling particularly enchanted in that moment. What would, what advice would you give for people to not just kind of go on like mountain tops and valleys with this, mm-hmm. um, but to really stick through this and begin to implement this into their life? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I'd go back to the that Ignatian practice is, is that pay attention to the surges of your heart um, during the day. Yeah, you're not going to go on some out like if you're going to work on a Monday morning and you're in a long com- car commute, you're not going like, wow, this is the most magical moment of my my day. Um, so you're right. No, I think it's a very important thing to end up. But but if you go through your day with that that practice of tracing the ribbon of grace that goes through it, where where does your heart thrill to live? And sometimes you know it's little things like like the way my dog greets me when I come in, and I get I feel that that joy, and and I, and I can say thank you for that. Um, or it's the good cup of coffee, or the good book, or the good audio book you're listening to that makes the traffic commute go by much more quickly. That that if we just practice. You know, Anne Lamont has this great book. She says there's three fundamental prayers we pray. Thanks, help, and wow. And I would say that's a great way to just say, hey, we're not talking about mountaintop experiences. We're saying when small graces come, just say thank you. And when you see something that moves your heart from um, a beautiful sunset um, or the coming of spring, um, like the pandemic. Remember how people were like, man, being outside and just seeing the flowers come out. Yeah, just practice saying thank you for that and saying, wow. And also, you know, when you're at your wit's end, just say help, you know, God help me turn out in a posture of dependence. I think prayers of thanks, help, and wow are great ways of just um, being being attentive to the sacred thing in the middle of the day, the highs, which is the thanks and the lows, which is the help. Um, But God is now a companion uh, and not some forgotten right? Some forgotten religious thing up in the sky that I encounter occasionally at church, but rather my, rather my friend uh, and helper through the day. That is a beautiful note to end on. I think that's going to be really helpful for people. Dr. Beck, once again, thank you so much for your time today. I have thoroughly enjoyed this. I know others will as well. I'd like to just uh, let you say the closing words of where people can find the book and your work if they want to keep up with what you're doing between Scooby-Doo demonology and uh, <laughs> theology of monsters and everything else in between. Yeah, yeah. Well, so um, you can find my books anywhere, um, online, indie bookstores, and also on the the, the other main sites. Um, but also I blog every every day, Monday through Friday at a blog called Experimental Theology, where I explore the intersections of psychology and faith. And so that's where you can find me. That's my only social media presence, but you can find me on my blog, um, Experimental Theology. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. And thanks to all of you who watch this, whenever it is that you watch this sometime (laughs) in the future. I really appreciate your time. And I'll close as I always do by saying until next time, be on the lookout for more videos. And as always, go out and love God and love others, because truly above all else, that will change the world.